I couldn't take it by force. So I make Americans feel guilty about using the energy that heats their homes, fuels their cars, runs their businesses, and powers their economy. I make cheap energy expensive, so that expensive energy would seem cheap. I would empower unelected bureaucrats to all but outlaw America's most abundant sources of energy. After banning its use in America, I make it illegal for American companies to ship it overseas. If I wanted America to fail, I'd use their schools to teach one generation of Americans that their factories and their cars will cause a new ice age. And I'd muster a straight face so I could teach the next generation that they're causing global warming. When it's cold out, I call it climate change instead. I'd imply that America's cities and factories could run on wind power and wishes. I teach children how to ignore the hypocrisy of condemning logging, mining, and farming while having rooms over their heads, heat in their homes, and food on their tables. I would never teach children that the free market is the only force in human history to uplift the poor, establish the middle class, and create lasting prosperity. Instead, I demonize prosperity itself so that they will not miss what they will never have. If I wanted America to fail, I would create countless new regulations and sell them cancel old ones. That would be so complicated that only bureaucrats, lawyers, and lobbyists could understand them. That way small businesses with big ideas wouldn't stand a chance. And I would never have to worry about another Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, or Steve Jobs. I would ridicule as flat earthers those who urge them to lower energy costs by increasing supply. And when the evangelists of common sense try to remind people about the laws of supply and demand, I enlist a sympathetic media to drown them out. If I wanted America to fail, I would empower unaccountable bureaucracy seated in a distant capital to bully Americans out of their dreams and their property rights. I'd send federal agents to raid guitar factories for using the wrong kind of wood. I'd force homeowners to tear down their own homes built on their own land. I'd make it almost impossible for farmers to farm, miners to mine, loggers to log, and builders to build. Because I don't believe in free markets, I'd invent false ones. I'd devise fictitious products like carbon credits and trade them in imaginary markets. I'd convince people that this would create jobs and be good for the economy. If I wanted America to fail, for every concern I invent a crisis, and for every crisis I invent a cause, like shutting down entire industries and killing tens of thousands of jobs in the name of saving spotted owls, and when everyone learned the stunning irony that the owls were victims of their larger cousins and not people, it would already be decades too late. If I wanted America to fail, I'd make it easier to stop commerce than to start it, easier to kill jobs than create them, more fashionable to resent success than to seek it. When industries seek to create jobs, I'd file lawsuits to stop them, and then I'd make taxpayers pay for my lawyers. If I wanted America to fail, I would transform the environmental agenda from a document of conservation to an economic suicide pact. I would concede entire industries to our economic rivals by imposing regulations that cost trillions. I would celebrate those who preach environmental austerity in public while indulging a lavish lifestyle in private. I convince Americans that Europe has it right and that America has it wrong. If I wanted America to fail, I would pray on the goodness and the decency of ordinary Americans. I would only need to convince them that all of this is for the greater good. If I wanted America to fail, I, I suppose I wouldn't change a thing. So this little snippet of what Senator Rich was talking about and what Damon was talking about, and one of the reasons that we decided as a sovereign state that we needed to step up, we needed to have a voice, we needed to have a say and a role in selecting our next president. One of the reasons why we decided to implement the first ever Idaho Republican Presidential Caucus. Um, and to talk about that, Dr. Ron Nate, who is the chairman of the Idaho GOP Caucus, uh, is gonna come forward and give us a little report. Please welcome Dr. Nate.
14 months ago, actually 17 months ago, I'm minding my own business as a co-chair of the Rules Committee at the State Central Committee meeting. And somebody proposes a rule about looking into a caucus. And uh, less than an hour later, I find myself the chair of the Idaho Caucus Committee. And uh, it's been a great ride. We put together a committee that had representation from each of the uh, seven regions around the state. We uh, did a little research. And Norm doesn't know this at the time. I don't know if he did know this, but uh, I wasn't a, a caucus supporter at the time. I thought, wow, we just closed the primaries. That might be a big bite to take all at once. But after doing just a little bit of research, we found out pretty quickly that it was uh, a little, uh, let me say, I was going to say silly, I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it seemed odd to us that we would have the most Republican state in the nation having a voice in a presidential contest so late after the nomination process had already been done. So we, we set about putting together a plan and, and seeing if the state central committee meeting or committee would want to put it together. And that was a plan to move up the date of selecting our nominee earlier in Idaho and also making it a fairly big prize. In other words, structure it so there would be winner take all if there was a predominant majority that wanted a particular candidate and uh, proportional if it was close. And so that's what we did. We, we structured it to be essentially winner take all. And uh, the the credit for this really goes to the committee, the state party, and all the counties that put this together. There's a tremendous amount of work. Um, the, the entire committee went about drafting rules, putting them together, hashing out changes, and did this in all six months. And then by the time we met in Moscow, we had a plan together, and the state central committee um, approved it. Since then, the state party has been absolutely um, stellar in helping put that plan into action. And uh, the counties, I personally visited about nine counties myself to talk about how a county would put together a caucus. And I learned more from them than they learned from me, I'm sure. That uh, there were some great ideas coming from all the counties I visited, and even others that I didn't even visit. And uh, I know that not all counties were on board at the beginning, but in the end, 44 counties put, put on a caucus, and uh, a few stats about it. We had nearly 48,000 people vote in our first ever Idaho GOP caucus. 19 of the counties finished their work in one round. That means that more than half the counties went multiple rounds on their, on their caucusing. Four hardworking counties went four rounds in their caucus voting. They deserve a round of applause. <laughs> We came out of the caucus with a clear winner of the, of the Idaho caucus, uh, receiving the 32 delegates. Oh, and by the way, Boise um, was, as far as I understand, the largest ever caucus in the United States. Um, with over 90,000 participants in the caucus. I have a few mementos. Here's our ballot from Madison County. Julie Yamamoto gave me a coin today from the Canyon County caucus. Uh, Senator Brent Hill was kind enough to bring back a member of the point from the Boise caucus. And so there's a lot, of, a lot of new artifacts in the Republican Party for Idaho that uh, are being built up. Maybe we should have a case at the, at the Idaho GOP Central with all these little mementos coming together because it truly was historic. For the first time ever um, in a nomination process, I looked up on the screen and saw CNN posting Idaho's results at a time when it mattered in choosing the President of the United States. Now, I don't, I don't cry, but uh, I got a little misty when I went to a few campaign events and saw presidential candidates coming to Idaho for the first time in my memory. I was counting it up while I was sitting there, and there's at least 12 visits by candidates. Every single Republican nominee, uh, nomination candidate came to Idaho to do a campaign event. And so So I think by, by all measures, you know, I, you know I, we were operating on faith that the candidates would pay attention, but it, it turns out that it wasn't faith at all. It was the idea that if you have a state that's willing to do the work, to, to, uh, to get the attention, to make a difference in the election, then the candidates will come. They want delegates. Idaho is proud to um, award their, the delegates to the to nominee uh, Mitt Romney. And, uh, 
and I look forward to four years from now. Now I know it, it wasn't perfect, but I can say a couple of things. It was more perfect than Nevada's first time around. It was more perfect than Iowa after all their years of experience. Idaho was more perfect than them. And you know what? In four years, Idaho will be more perfect than they were this year. Because we do have a few proposed rules changes. We need to tweak some things. I know it wasn't exactly perfect, but I think we did a wonderful job. I appreciate the counties and the chairman and the, and the, the work that the committees did. I appreciate the Idaho party. And that's my caucus update. Thank you all for your support. Being passed down the rows now is the survey. We want to get a, some feedback from the uh, convention about what you thought of the caucus, any suggestions for, uh, for uh, improvements on it. We want to make the, the caucus even better next time around. So thank you, Norm, for reminding me. Thank you. If you can go ahead and you can hand them uh, to the person at the door on the way out, or leave them at the registration table will be fine too if you want to turn them in even tomorrow. Appreciate uh, all the work, uh, Ron, his committee, all the people that were involved in this, a lot of thought went into it. It was a true grassroots effort with a lot of leadership, and uh, I can't tell you how much we at the State Party Headquarters appreciate all the work that you did in all the counties. We know it was a tremendous amount of work, and uh, it went off uh, pretty much without a hitch, so thank you all. Okay, with that, uh, we also had a redistricting task force, uh, a once every 10 year event is redistricting. Uh, one of the things that I heard the loudest when I first came in as chairman and throughout the next couple of years was, we want to be as a party more involved in redistricting, we want to give input into the process. Uh, we asked Steve Corey to chair that task force and we had members from all of the regions uh, and their job wasn't over when redistricting was over, uh, and I'd like Steve to come forward and, and give his report. Steve, please welcome Steve Corey, and thank you for all his work. Well, two years ago, I think uh, one of my biggest concerns about redistricting was what if we did get to the point where we were going to get a third congressional seat in the house. One of uh, the Congress persons from the back east have to sit down and have a, someone like-minded with us. Uh, when we went into this process, we were only about 150,000 persons short in the state, uh, within 10% of our population, basically. But uh, when that fear disappeared, it allowed me to kind of focus on the issue as a whole. And uh, a couple of years ago, when I came up and was talking about my concerns with, uh, with the chairman, and uh, we were talking about it, I don't know why he didn't tell me you're nuts, you shouldn't be getting involved in this. But, uh, I think I want to go ahead and uh, drift into one of the first things that uh, the, the committee did, looking at uh, possible commissioners, screening the candidates. Uh, you may not know this, but there are significant restrictions on who can be a commissioner. Uh, essentially, everyone on the State Central Committee cannot be on the commission. And that's something we may want to think about during the next couple of years to open up the uh, the limitations, go ahead and remove some of the limitations because some of our best and brightest cannot be on the redistricting commission. Um, the task force went ahead and looked at all the people that they were aware of that uh, were interested in being commissioners and, and uh, reviewed them to make sure they were not in violation of state law and um, presented their thoughts, and I know those were considered by the three appointing authorities, the President Pro Tem, the Speaker, and the Chairman. Um, I know that the, the task force really strongly recommends that that screening effort be done again in the uh, next round of redistricting. So let me talk specifically about um, the districts. The first commission we met last summer and there was a lot of discussion that had to occur. And uh, 
I, I can't even begin to express how much effort it took to extract from the three Democratic commissioners what they were going to require. Uh, essentially, on the last day of that session, we found out that they were going to uh, demand uh, that if you were in what would become districts 5, 6, 16, 17, 18, 19, 24, 26, and 29, they essentially picked you to be in that district and to find it. Uh, they also wanted to split Bingham County, but that was something that was rejected by the State Supreme Court a little bit later. This, the second commission went ahead and met this fall, um, and they picked up on the work of the first commission. Uh, they approved uh, a map which was the one that was presented to, uh, presented to the Supreme Court, to challenge in the Supreme Court. Uh, one of the things that the First Commission and the Second Commission expressed right from the start was the lack of guidance and advice that existed in doing the redistricting process. And the court came down with some very specific 